Hello everyone, today we talk about the organization of the English infantry of the Civil War. Uh, we made already uh, an introductory video on English Civil War infantry and this is just uh, a look a bit at the organic, right, how these armies looked like in, in composition, in strength, in size. Um, and th this is important because we're talking about a time of modern warfare in which um, things were definitely changing towards uh, from pike and shock to linear tactics, right? And England in this regard was um, in part a peripheral power in the sense that it definitely lacked, this is a bit the uh, early modern uh, English warfare in, in a nutshell, right? The, the idea that the, the English had relatively few resources and major military developments were taking place in the continent, right, especially at this time, you see basically a 30 years war. Um, the most famous examples are the, the, the Dutch, but especially the Swedish uh, models uh, heading towards, in fact, the abandoned the increase of the, the shot uh, at the expense of the pike and naturally the transformation of um, of tactics, of formations in the same army organizations, right? Um, but England is also very fascinating because albeit, um, you know, uh, being uh, in a certain sense an observer, it also manages to exit the, the 17th century as um, um, a rising f power that eventually would lead to, you know, the, the British Empire and its actual military efficiency, not just on sea but also on land. Um, that stemmed paradoxically exactly from, from this perception of the need to establish uh, a more centralized and permanent uh, model like it was happening in, uh, in the continent that will evolve eventually chiefly on you know the, the you know on, on the base of, of on the model if you want of, of the the French military in the second half of the 17th century under the Sun King it really changes a, a big deal that's the, the first truly uh, modern army by by many standards a permanent professional force um, that incidentally will you know it's what the the entire Europe will c uh, coalesce against. Um, but it's very fascinating because England really speeded up very quickly uh, in this regard, passing from a situation was um, quasi still quasi feudal, right? In the way well, the army was organized, with no permanent uh, military force, but just a militia that essentially was, you know, lagging behind. To eventually later on in this centralized model that is kind of ironically. Uh, triggered by and uh, formed, by accepted and levied, as a matter of fact, by the, by those same classes that uh, enacted the the English revolutions, right? Uh, and that had risen against uh, the king, um, uh, the king's uh, demands, exactly because of military matters. You know, the famous ship money and this uh, necessity that the Stuarts, uh, at, when at power, had legitimately recognized as, as necessary, right? It, it's a deep political, social, economical, but also cultural question at that point, because English history was to naturally grow to influence largely a lot of aspects in political theory um, and uh, for the further developments, especially in, during the 18th century, being still at the base of great part of Western um, uh, values in some way, um, even for those countries that didn't directly share it. But and it was the same people, the, the same class that eventually realized they had to pay, and <laughs> they had to pay even way more than what the ship money was, in exchange for definitely the rise to power with a you know mm, you know decreased monarchical uh, power, um, with a parliament that definitely had a, a much more direct control on the, the military instrument, um, uh, etc. So, um, today we don't discuss this, we should start a series on modern history to, to deepen it. Um, but I think looking at the uh, Civil War Army's organization uh, in, in England is definitely uh, it's definitely fascinating. It shows you even the differences between, already at this stage, between the, the, the royalists and the parliamentarians. 
um, in in two different models, also availability of resources, but also in fact political substantial political differences. It's obvious that the royalists were more kind of conservative. The parliamentarians introducing um, different you know ideas, different models that incidentally were also inspired, militarily speaking, by the developments in the uh, in con in the continent. So, and this is where we, we start from, because um, in when you look at this broad, this long century, I think the English revolutions are better studied if you really start from, you know, the, the rise of the Stuarts to, you know, Marlborough and um, these um, important political and military passages uh, in, in a sequence, right? We, we're looking at, at England that is definitely in ferment, right? And the same reason for which the revolutions happened in the first place and definitely uh, the English mm, you know literates were quite interested they were following the uh, military um, transformations and especially at that time the Dutch uh, the new Dutch style also because England was substantially signing uh, at this, I mean, the first half of of the 17th century, especially from you know supporting the Dutch in in anti-Spanish uh, function, albeit always naturally fearing in part their 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 preeminence on, on the sea, also sharing this Protestant influenced um, you know mindset regarding to the and especially the the English male classes, the ones in fact would rebel against the um, you know philo or crypto Catholic. Um, t uh, stewards, um, the uh, the military transformations as a form of mm, liberalization, like the idea of um, of a um, military change here, was also partly challenging the the greatest powers of the times, Spain, um, and Catholicism uh, behind it, and this is true also in part for for the Thirty Years' War proper, you know that. You know the 80, the eighty years war is uh, is intertwined also with these events. But you know if you look at Germany as well, and you observe um, the the what military conservatism was like, and so for certain powers, then the the new tactics introduced by Protestant Sweden, and being so also the, the most successful in absolute terms, you realize that it's also a different way of looking at war, and uh, uh, that is effectively a, a, a political instrument of of change in, in in that perspective. So naturally, everybody at the time was studying um, the new military changes. Actually, you know, we we stress very much the the, the reforms of Maurice of, of Nassau, the the Orangian. Um, military system, but you know, also the Spanish essentially were creating something similar with, you know, less um, deep uh, ranks of, uh, of shot of, of musketeers, and the um, this you know counter march system that enhanced and you know increased uh, the fire rate. Um, Etc. So we are not excess. We are not excessively documented after all about what is the we, the the reality on on the battlefield and um, in comparison to the be way better documented um, treatise production. Right. There is also a lot of, to to discuss relatively to what all these military theories were actually like, because if you read great part of these, you realize that they didn't make any sense in part, right? There were people still theorizing very weird stuff in a very uh, abstract way, um, thinking to copy, uh, for example, the, the classical orders, but as a matter of fact, you know, having surpassed them by, by far since at least uh, a couple of centuries. So, uh, and it was naturally a very different type of warfare that was taking place and changing um, by itself, right? Never think that military history, uh, a reformer arrives and changes the thing, right? The, the armies change already by themselves, and then uh, reformers can formalize and enhance and perfection did this this diversification. But it's it's part of a broader, um, I mean, this transformation. But it's part of a broader phenomenon that does pass through great reformers and military geniuses, the most complete of this age definitely being Gustavus Adolphus um, of Sweden, um, that really does make a difference as a man. But still, um, what is important to understand here is that not necessarily what you find on paper is what you find in reality. And that's why also um, and the Swedes actually 
mm, you know, did so well at that point because they had had a substantial uh, military, gained a substantial military experience and lesson from from very diverse um, theaters, right? Fighting with some substantially different enemies and realizing what uh, the, the best solution in many ways could be, right? And and this is also a fascinating time in history because you still find a lot of um, you know I'm uncertainty in this regard. It's not so simple to transition in these military systems because you have to pass effectively through the political obstacle, right? You, you can't see just in the t I don't know the technological advancement, uh, the the military transformation of the uh, early modern age, right? It it did pass primarily through a political and social. Uh, change without which you can't really have much in this regard. Why? Why all this problem in creating a permanent standard um, and um, uniformly drilled uh, army? Is it because you need a freaking amount of money to do that? If you don't have that, you can't do it, right? And with England, the problem had been exactly this: that there was uh, an iron arm and a struggle between the uh, the king and the parliament for letting more. Uh, resources, right, uh, and for for the army and the that that was a, an actual need, right. But that the the two sides were playing it like for their own, mm, you know, different political vision also. Um, so you can't understand this moment in history if you don't pass through that firstly. Um, this for saying that I, I have also my doubts. I admit I'm not an expert by any standard uh, on this topic as on many others I discuss of course as you know but um, it seems to me that we, we tend to to oversimplify what you know the, the various stages like you know, ju just the, the, the you know the, with the Spanish tertiary is kind of more evident because it's something that lasted quite a, for a longer time it was you know the, the military instrument of, with, of, of a great power that had a great continuity and a great um, a legacy in this regard, um, and that they surely had a traditionalist approach at one point, but it also saw the improvement and the changes that were, you know, naturally being uh, needed at that point on the battlefield. But this canton, especially of, uh, you know, the, the reforms of the Nassau and then the reforms of the Vasa, it, it sounds like, um, you know, uh, as if there were standard models that were applied, and then. We know that every campaign, every army, every battle was a different thing, right? So we are actually not even certain about what these actual changes were like, right? Not necessarily what we're about, because in a way they're kind of also intuitive to understand, but uh, we don't know the measure. As unfortunately, many times historically speaking, we have difficulties of realizing what what the hell happened concretely in the first place, and in such a messy world where you r really don't have a, a centralized state, a massive bureaucracy, you don't you don't you can't reconstruct a big deal, even what happens on the field. So it's very important to study these period of 17 centuries of dramatic importance for European history basically in all fields even if you look at philosophy you know everything that occurs for example in the 18th century was in Nuta already in the 17th right and, and there is this great struggle and potentially it was a devastating century it was an iron century think about the 30 years war that wipes out one third of the Germans and engulfs the whole continent think about the, the English uh, revolutions and the civil war what what you know these were big, big changes in the, the European expansion worldwide, etc. Um, so, in general, however, we notice in here that um, I was stressing the th thing of this thing of this difference between theory and practice because we have to realize even in here that in England, especially certain classes and certain. Um, uh, minds were thinking, uh, looking at, for example, the Dutch style as a you know thing to to follow, right? Because from the other side, could be from the royalist side, could be seen as a more subversive and kind of uh, um, you know the the spies thing, right? Think about uh, and this time in the 17th century, we we focus as moderns, in fact, on the modernization process, but here there is still a feudal Europe in, 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 in its truest uh, sense like this is still Middle Ages let's be honest right there is an incredibly strong military edus 
still stemming in values of the nobility, of the individual strength, of, of, of cavalry in itself, in spite of all the changes that occurred and cavalry having lost um, the, the, the tactical preeminence since the, since the, the you know, a couple of centuries now, definitely. So, um, incidentally, this is also the moment in which cavalry will re regain a bit of strength in the, seven, uh, in the second half of the 17th and eventually in the 18th too. Um, but um, um, it's important because this attention towards certain uh, English thinkers toward the, the Dutch model also could alter our realization of what the actual English military thinking in practice was right when it, it took to fight for, for real and in a very different context from the one of, of the Netherlands or even of Germany or, or other areas. Um, so there is an idea that the English were mirroring if effectively in, in large part the Dutch company and regimental organization right for their infantry units but um, even so this offered a fair amount of latitude as we know the United Provinces had attempted initially to standardize their companies and in f 1599 they had set the strength of 100, 135 officers and men um, being these captain, lieutenant, and ensign to surgeons, three corporals, two drummers, a cleric, a uh, chirurgeon, a provost, uh, three pages, then 45 pikemen, 30 musketeers, and 45, uh, 44 uh, arquebusiers, right? And in 1609, the arquebus was withdrawn from companies in Dutch service and Therefore, we're talking now about an equal proportion of musketeers and pikemen, right? So it, the tides are slowly changing, you know, the tur turning. And um, so this 101 um, uh, number uh, relation was countered by the increased um, killing power of the musket over the, the arquebus, right? The problem is, is that the Dutch themselves had not successfully achieved standards for company or regimental strengths, right? And uh, the same drill for English troops in Dutch service shows this in, in the manuals. There is one quoting, uh, we can quote, Companies are compacted into regiments commanded by coronels. Regiments contain not always a like number of companies, some having 10, some 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and some 30 companies. And above, um, the companies are some more in number and some less. Some reach 300 men, some 200, some 100, some 90, some 80, some 70. This flexible system was still the norm in the service of the United Provinces in the 1630s, as Henry Exman's manual indicates. And the same Exman refers to companies of 120, 150, 200, and 250 men. And... Uh, also uses companies of 80 or 160 men in his diagrams for company formations. So this model was basically followed in England as well, right? The infantry at this point was formed into regiments composed of a staff and several companies. The essential difference was, however, the absence of a standing army. So this remained on paper most of the times, depending on the necessity. As you understand, this is very important because you don't have actually troops that are always uh, in arms and that you keep uh, trained and there is no, even logistically speaking, there is not much of you know, resources to, to sustain them and need a political necessity to do that, right? So uh, this means that regiments were raised anew for each military expedition. Now it is this also lowers the cohesion and the quality of these units in the field. Uh, in this way, though, the Privy Council or the commander that was to specify a given number of the unit right, each time that an army was formed, right? And yet that was not the number of the actual troops that would be raised in practice, nor that would stay within the ranks in the first place, right? So all this makes you understand, I think, well, well, kind of what degree of heterogeneity existed during the English Civil War. 
And there are examples, actually also from previous times, um, there is, um, this, uh, the army was raised in 1620 to back the ter territorial claims of James I's daughter, Elizabeth, in the Palatinate. And that also uh, raised for the, actually raised, by the way, so that this was an army eventually was used uh, for the first bishop's war, right? So the first one counted 13 companies in a regiment, right? The colonel's company, so the, the most important, uh, um, counted 192 men, while the other 12 companies, the, the one of the lieutenants, were with 144 men. Right. The second army said the one actually levied had 12 companies, the colonels one with eight, uh, 188 men, and the um, lieutenants colonel with 140, and actually all the other 10 companies, not all were led by lieutenants, excuse me, I got confused, but lieutenant colonels with 140, and all the other 10 companies with 105 men each, right? And the in all uh, cases, the number quoted is for the for private soldiers only. The officers instead were uh, both commissioned and non-commissioned were counted separately, right? And we'll see that how that is important also for especially in the Royalist Army during the Civil War. Um, and naturally, th there was some room for experimentation here, for innovation. Uh, there is this example of, um, of of the five regiments which were raised in 1642 to suppress the Irish popular revolt. So the theoretical organization of these regiments was to be 1,000 men per each, divided amongst five companies, right? Um, one of which was to have been equipped with only with firelocks. Now this is very interesting because you know here there is this substitution progressively of the you know the the dog the firelock was the, were also known as the dog lock or English lock muskets in this in this case instead of the match lock ones they were the older um and um and also of pikes in that regard meaning that one regiment was to be equipped solely with shot now that that's remarkable because we're in 1642, right? Uh, pikes were to disappear in um, just at the beginning of the 18th century by a rule. So it would be interesting also to look at always at, at the where, where these armies were employed, right? Um, during the uh, the English Civil War was definitely uh, a fast um, decrease in pike, right? Um, there were sharpshooters and other important shot units that were, you know, the flexibility of which was very much required, especially in battlefields, like in closed spaces, like, you know, farms, orchards, the, this stuff, and, and not just, you know, in, you know, open, classical open field battle. So in here, naturally, the uh, cohesion of, of the pike formation was really was impossible to 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 attain in the same ways and 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 that's what increased the importance of uh, firearms uh, in the same way so in the case of 1642 though so all the, this for one regiment the other four were instead equipped with um presumably with fire locks in part and match locks still and uh, muskets and then um and then pikes classically right and in this case, however, only one regiment reached Ireland, right? And the others were eventually reformed for service in uh, in England during the Civil War. So this this shows you how, even in the practice, something was about to be formulated in in um, towards the the direction of increase of shot. And um, during the at the outbreak, let's say, of the Civil War, you also have to think that, unavoidably, both the Royalists and the Parliamentarians had a common military culture, right? Before we, we stress, naturally, the political differences, the, the cultural differences, the, the social 
um, class differences, etc. But they were still English, right? They all shared this kind of common... I mean, the, the military in this regard had be always been there, right? They were in two different countries with two different traditions. Um, and so as far as infantry organization is concerned, however, this left room for considerable variations still, right? So as we've seen, the original Dutch model was very flexible compared to the traditional Spanish one, and the English themselves had also recently begun to experiment in, in, in different styles, as we've seen. So the most popular one had become a regiment with 10 companies and a total strength of 1,000 or 1,200 men, plus officers separated. So the companies normally were of, um, you know, 100 men, giving a to the total of 1,000 in the in the regiment. Um, however, they could also be organized in a unequal system. Let's say with the colonel's company consisting of double 200 men, um, the lieutenant lieutenant's colonels of 160, and the sergeant majors of 140. Right, and each of the other seven of 100 men with a, a total of 1,200. Uh, the army raised by Parliament and commanded by the Earl of Essex is known to have used the system of unequal companies, right, that we have just described, as the lists of regiments and officers printed in 1642 specifically say so. The Parliament introduced the number of companies in excess regiments in 1644 from 10 to 8, right? But this mostly stemmed from the need actually to merge the uh, now weakened uh, companies, then actually changing the organizational structure of the army. In 1645, the system used at the outbreak of the war was retained, right? And in fact, the, even the new model army was raised on the same basis as Exodus is in 1642. On the other hand, if you look at the Scottish army hired by the English in 1642 to serve in Ireland, used a theoretical system of 10 companies of 100 men, each plus officers. And we don't know if these systems were adopted also in the monarchic or in the king's army, right, as a by the royalists, as we actually don't have formal specifications in this regard, so we we don't know, and this is a pro this tells you how much we rely actually on paper strength sometimes to understand even in the first place how these armies were organized um, but uh, it seems that even among royalists, the aim was the ten companies right but uh, which of the two styles of the 1,000 with uniform company size or the 1,200 with um, an equal size w was preferred, we, we simply don't know, right? In many respects, uh, the theory went by the board, however, anyway, as some colonels, especially from the royalist side, never managed to record a full recruitment, right? Um, there is also the problem that the royalists uh, were generally... Um, more um, rely, uh, reliant on commission, right? Their troops were usually levied by themselves uh, with a commission system. The parliamentarians used the uh, a mixed model. Usually they, they recruited some of the finest armies with a mixed commissionary and um, conscriptory uh, levy. And, and naturally... This uh, it's not just about the two the difference in the two formulas, but how how many resources you have at your disposal. What's the political and military mandate of of that army, and um, and lots of other things. Generally speaking, you know that the, the royalists were stereotypically much more indebted and you know um, running short of troops sometimes, using even you know really peasants with just clubs, where it happens sometimes, in the case of necessity. Consider also that these armies didn't have any, uh, you know, they had very few logistical resources that they had to, to pillage in order to sustain themselves, literally 
other, the other option was starving to death and there were many regulations aimed at interrupting the, the pillaging but uh, still there were large numbers of people because even at least you know this there was no way to stop them anyway but um, the point is that through the commission you tend to speculate more right the idea is that you get money for levying a certain amount of troops then you basically recruit less and you you put money in your pockets right and this was important uh, sometimes I mean, it was not necessarily by itself the wrong thing because maybe those resources were invested anyway in some other form but still the idea is that uh, a stronger government is able to check better you know to to give more drill more discipline also in this regard to fund s simply these this con army of conscripts um, in a more in a more efficient way not that royalists were necessarily just a bunch of you know they, they, they had their own discipline they had their own fine organization sometimes which simply they didn't have enough resources in general um, the parliamentarians weren't faring excessively better, right, given their their strategical situation as well during the war. So, um, in other regiments, um, however, the colonel's local influence remained powerful, right? Uh, among royalists, the, there was naturally uh, control of many you know, manors, land, etc., so there was a way to recur to more direct means of living, right? To raise extra companies, incorporate others from the disbanded units of the, the, his, uh, their own regiments. The Earl of Manchester, for example, had 19 companies in his own regiment, right? So this tells you how much, this is typical of every prolonged war, right? Even if you look, I don't know, ancient Rome, as how many legions could be in a single army? Because now they were worn out. They had, they were terribly under strength. Um, so it was important to maintain the continuity of the unit for also reasons of uh, spirit of the corp, etc. But naturally, this would operate in very different ways on the field. That's also why we don't know so much, after all, about how much theory was applied in practice, because the theory still reasoned largely through you know ideal numbers, right? In the reality of warfare was quite quite different. So also this mm, tendential attraction for geometric, you know, for perfect order, for uh, correct proportions, um, quantities, spaces, etc., was you know was quite ideal to say to say the least. Um, another a royalist, Sir Arthur uh, Hazelridge, he had 12 companies in his regiment, and Sir William Brereton had 16 in his, including three of dragoons and one of firelocks. And now, this is interesting because also it was a problem to, to have uh, weapons in the first place. I mean, uh, uh, guns costed, right? Um, and regarding the dragoons, it's also interesting that, you know, the dragoon is considered normally as mounted um, infantry or, I mean, usually a cavalry unit effectively capable of dismounting as well. So, foot cavalry in some ways. Actually, in this context, the uh, dragoon regiments were, uh, I mean, talking about the English Civil War, was kind of closer to, to an infantry unit than a cavalry one, right? And naturally... Uh, there is this cliche, which is partly true, I suspect, that among royalists, actually, cavalry was um, a greater thing than among the parliamentarians. Not necessarily a, an enormous deal, given that pike and shock tactics were still dominating, but, you know, still uh, important enough to, to make a difference. And there was all uh, an equestrian noble tradition about cavalry, and it was a sense of pride of you know for for a nobleman fighting against the republicans um you know showing the, the proving the displaying this greater uh way of fighting on horseback according to their beliefs um this is also somewhat ideal but um it's, it's the case and we we find also the militia regiments that were famously the london trained bands were these associations of citizens that were 
uh, this sometimes simply, uh, especially before the war, this um, in fact war enthusiasts, right? Yeah, that were soaked also in this idea of experimenting new formations and theories, but it, it was still a militia. So actually, they accomplished a relatively few. Um, the trained bands of London were the uh, most consistent because London was simply the largest and obviously the largest city and uh, largest and richest city uh, in England and having therefore more resources were finely equipped troops after all. Simply they weren't professionals so that's always the, the, the main difference. And um, so this militias, together with other auxiliaries, follows uh, followed systems that were dictated by local conditions more more often, but were still based, however, on the model of a staff and several companies, just like the the, the professionals. Let's call them this way. The number of companies in a regiment varied, as did the number of men in the company. So here it gets even more complicated. Before the Civil War, for example, if you take the trained band companies in the cities of London and of Westminster, um, you notice around 300 men plus, uh, each plus officers, right? The city of Westminster retained this theoretical system throughout the war, but for example, the London trained bands um, did not and uh, were reorganized to equal companies of 200 men each in 1642. And in the counties, uh, out in the counties, the intention seems to have been companies of about 100 men, right? But even in here, there are uh, many local variations. Concerning the officers, right? So, as we have mentioned above, uh, English infantry regiments were based upon the Dutch model, right? And the aforementioned uh, army of the Earl of Essex raised in 1642 offers uh, in, uh, kind of an ideal, or at least pretty good, example what this could, could be. So, if you look at the regimental staff, first of all we have the colonel, the lieutenant colonel, sergeant major, quartermaster, uh, the provost marshal, it was important because of discipline, the chirurgian, uh, the preacher, wagon master, the drum major, and two chirurgians, mates, right? The Companies had instead the uh, the following organization. Now we have a colon the colonel's company. We have the colonel as a captain, and then the captain lieutenant, um, the ensign, three sergeants, three corporals, two drummers, two hundred soldiers. Then you have the lieutenant colonel's company, which has the lieutenant colonel as a captain, then the lieutenant and the ensign, two sergeants, three corporals, two drummers, one hundred sixty soldiers. You have the sergeant major's company, has the sergeant major as a captain, lieutenant, ensign, two sergeants, three corporals, uh, two drummers, and 140 uh, soldiers. Then you have seven ca uh, the seven captains' companies, which have the, the captain, the lieutenant, the, the ensign, two sergeants, three corporals, two drummers, and 100 uh, soldiers. Right? Now, these are people that uh, are all to be paid. Think about all the organizations. These people are that were clerks, importantly as well, that were in charge of the pay. Rarely the pay arrived. Oh, this was a, also a great problem for maintaining troops in the field. Um, sometimes discipline, but uh, sometimes even to maintain them, them uh, at all. Right. So you see that it's um, it's an imposant. Um, uh, Stuff, but um, you know th there are sometimes there are three other officers in listed in some regiments during civil war, and these were another, the figure of the gentleman at arms, right? Um, in fact, the clerk, as we're saying now, and the lance passado, and the the clerk is uh, to be found on the company rolls of both armies, right? And uh, in fact, it's strange that X, uh, Essex's list uh, doesn't doesn't mention it. The, the clerk was an officer himself and was termed captain at arms uh, in the Scottish service. For example, he was responsible for the inspection of the company's arms, the storage of its immediate supply of gunpowder, 
bullets and and, and match cord right so the um, important um, you know tools without which you can't fight you can't operate your your guns in the first place then uh, the clerk is to, is often found on both the regimental and company strengths, given its importance, as he also had to uh, keep the company master roles and often to receive the soldier's pay and sometimes to distribute it under uh, his captain's orders. Right, while the Lance Pasado was another junior officer who ranked below the corporal and, and whose duty was to assist him. Wait, and this officer is um, only recorded on the rolls of the Eastern Association, although the, this, this figure is mentioned also in many other manuals, actually before and also after the Civil War. So passing to numbers, um, we have maybe some examples. So Whatever the theoretical organization of a regiment was, you can't be that, you know. Uh, there was no regiment, no company that was alike another, right? But by all standards, um, things changed dramatically. No army has ever been historically identical to another, not even one, right? It's normal at this point in any war, you have losses, but you also at this point have a lot of uh, desertions and... Uh, it's on this that really warfare is waged mo most of the times. Um, and that uh, at the beginning of the Civil War, the it was the, the figure of colonels was were were quite respected because they they were the people in in charge with the f filling of their companies, right? But with real war breaking out, uh, you, you can think of the weather and the wearing out of clothes, uh, the, the losses for, for sickness chiefly, right? At this point, the major killers, not enemies, um, bullets or blades, it's, it's li really disease. So at this point, uh, you know, the, the, the military administration really had to, to perform in, in a way this, the, the, the armies on the field could even remain standing in, in this regard. So it was jo not just organizing the troops before leaving, it's maintaining them on the field. So um, the we have surviving master roles from the time that show us this terrible losses, these continuous losses in the regimental uh, strength, right? So continuous recruitment has to go on. Um, and on the long run, the parliament had more resources, was better able to organize the recruitment of its infantry, right? The royalists were suffering uh, more. And as a consequence, the parliamentary regiments were usually larger. Um, and also, in this sense, also tactically more efficient for, for the uh, tasks that were, that were organized uh, for. And um, there was an attempt both from the Parliament and the Royalists in uh, towards the end of the war somewhat um, to reshape their armies by you know uh, in amalgamating the weaker regiments and especially saving the excessive costs of weak companies with almost complete officer caters. Now this was a big problem because the tendency was especially among the Royalists to actually keep uh, always, uh, you know, in in full strength, the the officer uh, caters and um, having a very an astonishing few amount of, of soldiers in the first place. Now, this was done also for political reasons, for you know, for corruption in part, uh, for maintaining these troops through commission, as we have seen before, and not having a much of a functional unit on the field. Um, and the and this was a big political problem because eventually the new model army, you know, it Cromwell uses iron fist and makes things work, uh, especially from a military point of view. Um, the uh, you know there was a stronger discipline, a better organization, a more meritocratic way of, uh, of organizing the army. 
different record and system as well. While the the king's armies were still kind of rigged by this personal interests of the, of the aristocracy, and and therefore the thing th didn't quite fare well for them. So we have two example exactly from this phase in 1644 about the regi uh, regimental strengths of parli uh, one parliament army and um, a king's army. Yeah, and here I think, I'm, I'm not sure whether the second is a garrison, but anyhow, so let's read it. So we hear for the parliament army of the Earl of Essex, um, that includes men, here that there is all the least, all the various regiments. We have the numbers from April, the one from June. We have the regiment of Tyrell, we have April 297 and June 524. Lord Robarts, for April 263, June 700. Skippon, April 258, June f um, 550. Fortescue, April 233, June 634. Berkeley, April, we, we actually don't know, then June 475. Davies, April 196, June 316. So you see here how wildly they were here, they were filling the ranks naturally from April to June but you see the deformity in here, right? Here the numbers vary um, from 700 to um, of, of the regiments to, to 360 and here, w whichever the cause of these numbers was in, in the political reasons, internal administration, losses, whatever here you gotta admit that in in the field these regiments evidently had different uh, employments, right? And we can't take the number just as a variable, as if you know there were perfectly symmetric formations and these units all operate in the same way. There was definitely uh, a different, you know, presumably these regiments also varied wildly in experience. Right, so there were troops that maybe I don't know the the most numerous regiments maybe had were filled more rapidly here uh the one from lord R Robarts, seven hundred men has gained uh has had a horizon from two hundred sixty three right here the, the one from Davis had from one hundred ninety six to three hundred sixteen so yeah, well, the proportion maybe here is not fitting, but i mean the the concept is is that certain certain armies, uh, certain of these regiments had more or less new troops in quality, right? And we don't know how much experience they had gained, I mean, the, the veterans that had remained. So, you can imagine how this really mixes a lot the, the cards, if you want, in, in the actual field employment of these units. Then we have the auxiliary regiments with Sir William Waller. Um, here we have just the uh, size from one uh, one given month. So Borough of Southwark in April uh, 1644, number six, uh, 611. The Tower Hamlets in April, number 568. And the City of Westminster in May 604. Right. Then we have the Army of the Earl of Manchester. Um, we have the numbers of uh, of May um, and the army. Uh, excuse me, and the uh, numbers of July. So, listen to the regiments: Crawford in May eight hundred fifty, July six hundred eight; Pickering in May seven hundred thirty eight, July five hundred twenty four; Montagu May seven hundred fifty nine, July four hundred eighteen. Russell, May 932, July 662. So here you, you notice the drop, right? Here, think about that warfare is also largely seasonal. This was the toughest moment in terms of engagements. Um, so, yeah. And still we have basically, uh, the, you know, Crawford 608. You know, they, they all start with similar size, right, and instead they there are certain units that took more losses, right, like Montagu 418 and Crawford 608 in July, they're, they're different widely, given that they were originally 759 and 850, respectively. Then, passing at the King's Army, uh, the reading garrison of April 1644, we have this 
regiments uh, of which we have the men, the officers and the number of companies uh, quantitatively. So we have Telwal, 127 men, 69 officers for a number of seven companies. You see here basically the officers are more than one half of the effectives and this is a problem we were talking about before, right? That the official carriers were standing but the troops didn't. You know, these are very low num numbers. I mean these um, these regiments have basically the size of a company. At, uh, I mean a bit more, yes, but uh, sometimes even less, right? Given that we had given to 100 and 200 for the colonel's um, company, the, the largest. So, uh, Owen, 106 men, 39 officers for four companies. Lille, 889 men and one, uh, 81 officers for eight companies. Penny men, 360 men, 119 officers for 11 companies. Gilby, 268 men, 107 officers and 11 comp for 11 companies. Lloyd, uh, 308 men, 101 officers for 10 companies. Hawkins, 171 men, 104 officers, 9 companies. Stradling, 246 men. 105 officers, 10 companies. Astley, 146 men, 71 officers, and uh, for 8 companies. Ewer, um, 59 men, 32 officers for 3 companies. Volgan, 195 men, 600, uh, excuse me, 65 officers and for 5 companies. Blackwell, 56 men, 30 officers for four companies. So the total of of the king's army uh, with all these regiments there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 regiments, right? So this fits into the, you know, loosely into what the, the standard uh, organization was, but counts uh, 2,231 men 923 officers for 90 companies. So you see here that uh, th there is a disproportion right, between the officers and the men. The latter being much less than we should uh, be. But I mean much less. You are talking about really um, sometimes even le even less than one tenth on the actual strength. The larger being the one of Penny Man with 260 men, right? The smaller the one of Blackwell, 56 men. And yeah, and the proportion with the officers is clamorous, right? So these master lists illustrate a major problem. So you see here the comparison between the, the parliamentary and royalist armies. Here the royalist armies really have a big problem. Private soldiers melted away with disheartening regularity, while the officer cater remains basically almost intact because actually the number of the officers is, is pretty uh, close to the, to the full strength here. Right. Um, consider that at full strength, the officers of the 90 companies would have had, in fact, 1,000 men. And here there are 90, uh, excuse me, uh, 923. Right. The full complement of private soldiers would be 9,000. Here we have 200, excuse me, 2,231. You see how messed up this is. So, yeah, and... This was about the organic. How, now, how were these troops actually employed on the field? Well, the towards especially the end of the war, the, the, the Swedish influence here had been something, right? The ideally the foot regiment of the in, in battle line of the English armies would be essentially um, three divisions, right? It, these were called divisions, but it had nothing to do with modern division, the, the term that was invented later, 
it here it literally means to divide etymologically so there were three chunks let's put it in this way regiments uh, of, of one in, within one regiment and these were usually uh, deployed with um, essentially two divisions on on the side and one either in advance position in the middle or I mean in the middle but either in advance or um, posterior um, position right to either being the sense respectively either more offensive or more like a defensive as a reserve for the other two and internally these divisions were organized in a um, tendentially homogeneous way um, with the with the pikes in the middle talking about 22 files then uh, the muskets on the sides 15 files and then a reserve behind the pikemen of six files of muskets right and the idea is that there has to be a sort of mutually supportive role here um, so there was this other formation that is called in fact the, by the sources the, uh, the the Swedish brigade right that had um, uh, a more there was the, the more the most modern formation in there was famously used in fact by the army of Gustavus Adolphus and also in here we see that it was employed by the English now the, the Swedish brigade um, was mm, represented uh, in a diagram by Lord Ray who was a contemporary as also served in the war and uh, this um, unit was composed apparently by two regiments made up by two squadrons respectively so what you see in in this picture is fundamentally a flattening of the you know uh, of, of the formation right uh, um, less a uh, minor depth than the usual lesser depth than the usual and this tendency towards linear tactics right so here we have the um, you see uh, it, it's a major these are two regiments all together so this is becoming a more powerful formation all concentrated towards uh, a more linear effort you see that the lines of muskets now are basically increased in um, in, fr in the front uh, line uh, length right so you you have more firepower at once and the pikes are progressively reduced especially with this kind of spearhead triangular formation you find the um, other musketeers in, in reserve uh, and also with, with also room to maneuver in the center so I don't know how but here we are in the realm of speculation and remember this is still a theoretical representation but you can imagine that the um, muskets in the center could advance right so that the, the musketeers could swarm around uh, protected by uh, this triangle of, of pikemen and catching the enemy in a kind of a you know for, you know fire uh, from different angle angles from also in coordination with the musketeers on on the sides then you find in, in reserve this other uh, you know theoretically standard line of center of pike and musketeers on the flanks and this is a big formation right and 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 the English are um, I, I don't know whether this is actually witnessed in 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 English warfare but it was at least studied and possibly also you know they, they tried to applicate it also the other one was the regiment according to the Swedish Brigade was a smaller unit that we get from the here a presentation of the complete body of the art military by Richard Elton and here you see it actually just with three um, you, squ let's call them squadrons right but probably there was a fourth one in the at least this is how I've seen it uh, tendentially uh, it, uh, a, a fourth one in the, in the front right symmetrically with the the others the uh, the one in the rear so you here you see fundamentally the the old square of pikes has opened into four different units in the middle there is nothing but 
still there is an increase in the in the musketeers that swarm all around and they're mutually supportive and n not just uh, among them you see the reserves here in the uh, there are many more musketeer units in in the rear of each squadron than than in the front you have just two but they can uniquely support not just each other but the same pikemen right as it was in the first place but having uh in here a, a an advanced position, like the, the most advanced musketeer here is, is in front of, of, of the pike. It was so also in the Spanish Tercio, telling the truth. But the in the Spanish Tercio the pike square was much larger. And here you said you see a line right of pikemen. So this formation in turn is it's as if it was replicating partly the same squ squadron uh, you know supportive system with this uh, quadrangle that uh, is it's more flexible like the idea in here is that as if the, the the pikes were all more you know diluted and compressed and um, you know sheltered by the musket so the, the musket is literally enveloping the pike um, and and this trilinear formation that was you know the, the famous uh, triplex accus of the of the that also Maurice of Nassau was you know, reading from, from the uh, classical sources of the Roman legion, etc. Here is reflecting the need of, um, you know, a progress, a gradual effort made of reserves, right? In which, however, the musketry has an increasing importance, right? And this is especially a smaller unit. But if you look at the first one we've seen, the Swiss Brigade, you find this this is actually a big unit, and exactly in that you see that. It's as if there was a, a great a greater um economy in there for which the muskets are the the, the wall formation is is getting flatter uh, flatter and flatter with and and uh wider and wider with always more uh musket front uh liners let's say so this stuff was w w well known in in england um that was starting the developments of you know in the Thirty Years' War, we're sending troops actually in Germany as we have seen before as well, and in the in the Netherlands now, and um, therefore getting this new stimulus straight from from the source from from, from the spring. And yeah, there could be you could say other stuff we can uh, say I don't know that the English armies were less protected on average and had less armor than, than others but this probably actually increased the same importance of shot right even if um, you know th that is a factor to be considered what, what is here the problem is that the pikes are getting always like well, the, the, the whole idea of pike and shot is that you know the pike is there as long as basically advancing still arrives at the enemy lines without being wiped out by musketry when this happens the pikes disappear from the field this would happen in 60 years or so um from the 40s and um so but but the idea is that the pike here has a resistance as well so if the pikeman is better armored for example it's obvious that the effectiveness of the the pike uh, by you know standard um shot effectiveness is 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 greater right so more importance in those systems will be given to 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 the to to the pikemen in england even this was not true right um and um and that was a factor for which probably musketry definitely also was costly at the time uh, consider that this moment were areas like england well yeah was supplied with with his weapons it still costed a lot, but you think about Ireland that they they had the the Papal Nuncio that had to send them <laughs> you know muskets from 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 Italy to to have actually arm uh, I mean um, firepower in the first place because Irish armies largely couldn't afford musketry. Um, in um, uh, another element of interest in in this regard is that um, if the Comp uh, I mean the the actual strength of the units is so thinned. Probably all these greater, um, you know, geometrical, you know, these ideal repartitions of the armies interaction is you know fails largely in practice. So this means that 
it's a wilder clash in which probably even cavalry has a greater impact um, but also musketry has well it's the pikes actually that to, in order to be effective require larger numbers on average so um, probably the English Civil War saw a steady rise of uh, a faster rise at least of of the shot in in the system than than other places um, and in general I think that the uh, the general landscape in which the English Civil War was fought and also the, the smaller numbers brought possibly to in fact more guerrilla tactics employed, more flexibility required and therefore at that point the, the pike also decreases uh, in, in use again because you need you know thickly packed, ordered and slow formation where what you need in that context instead is essentially firepower and mobility so Musketeers and cavalry are going to be um, more effective. Yeah, so we could tell else because actually it's plenty of numbers of, um, for example, of strength. You know, these master rolls and other, even ideal paper strength. So, but uh, I think the examples we mentioned are pretty pretty meaningful by themselves and they're pretty standard pretty eloquent especially about the larger armies that are what we care about the, the most so I think we can stop it here for now and we will talk again about of course uh, English Civil War armies we made these two videos for now about uh, infantry and we will maybe dig a bit more cavalry in the future but it's definitely a very very interesting topic and I advise you to study the English Civil War, the English Revolution, the 17th century in general right because that really tells you a lot, right? opens your eyes about about English history um, alright so for now just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye